welcome to another episode of the Caffeinated Librarians. I'm Simona. I'm Amy. And today we're going to be discussing The Never-Ending Story. So The Never-Ending Story is a classic 80s fantasy adventure film. It was created in 1984, and it's based on the 1979 novel of the same name by a German author. So just a brief uh, introduction about what the film is about. So it tells the story of a young boy named Bastian, who um, he runs into this bookstore and he happens upon this magical book. And the book tells the story of a young warrior who has to prevent this malevolent force from destroying all of Fantasia, which is the magical land where the book takes place. So Amy and I rewatched this movie. It's part of our November nostalgia series that we're doing. Um, I've watched this film already a few times. It's one of my favorite. I also did read the book, but that was a few years ago. So I don't remember it completely, but I know that the movie sort of um, ends at about the midway point of the book. Correct. But um, yeah. let's get into um, the film. And Amy, were there any parts of the film, like after you rewatched it, uh, that you probably noticed something that you hadn't noticed before or you thought differently about a particular scene or moment in the film? Um, you know, actually, like, I'm surprised how well the, um, the soundtrack held up, you know? Like, yeah. I, I knew, I knew anytime I heard that, you know, that, like, the, the big song, the intro song, which is actually um kaja gugu like i did not the the sit to shy shy we don't have the rights so i can't sing this for real um but anyway so but it's it's the same artist you don't see it generally as kaja gugu because it's not the band it's the lead singer oh i see which okay. was which just was interesting but the whole soundtrack was you know, like the, doo -doo 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 -doo. like mm -hmm. that whole, the whole thing really just kept, kept the magic for me. Like, I really didn't think that, you know, like those big, those big overtures of music would, would actually transport as well as they, they used to. But, you know, like when he's flying on Falcor and like all of the music, I just thought was still really cool for me and and I also read a lot about like movie trivia I I read I read the book a few years ago as well um and yeah you're right it like it stopped at the midpoint and then the sequel which actually came out a few years later and was not very well received because it wasn't the same director um was was the end of the book but I don't remember it at all even though it had Jonathan Brandis on it in it and that's why I went to watch it because I was a kid and I love Jonathan Brandis so <laughs> um but I found out a lot of um you know that that Michael was it Michael end yeah yeah he hated the movie he wanted his name taken entirely off the credits. He wanted nothing to do with it. He actually tried to sue to get them to stop production because he hated it so much. Yeah, I read the same thing. I mean, I, I recall that he, like hearing or reading somewhere that he really hated the film. And um, I, I was also looking up some trivia and I read, I was surprised that he tried to sue. I was trying to like find why he did not like the film because reading reviews of, um, I went on Goodreads and I wanted to read some reviews about the book. And a lot of people who enjoyed the book, at least the first half of the book, um, said that the film was pretty faithful to the first half of the book. Um, like I said, it's been a few years, so I really don't recall. Um, but many people who read the book um, gave like it like three stars or two stars mm -hmm. did so because they said the second half of the book was almost unnecessary and I it, agree kind it of lost the magic um, of, of the first half of the book it could have also been done in a different order mm. you know like um 
but I, I definitely felt like when I when I listened to the book and I got to the point that I thought it ended, I was like, what? <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I know that he did not like the visuals, really. Um, he thought that, oh, my goodness. Hold on. I'm going to mute for a moment. Sure. It's just a full-on idiot party over here. Maybe just talk about something else, and I'll come back. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So as Amy mentioned, the writer of the story had some major issues with the uh, with the way the book was adapted into film. Um, I actually enjoy the film. Um, as Amy said, the soundtrack still holds up very well. There, the magic of the film still holds up very well. Um, some of the visual effects, not so much, but in my opinion, what I do love about a time prior to special effects and like, not special effects, but CGI, was that you really had to um, work to sort of achieve what we are so easily able to achieve now. But sometimes I feel like it falls flat and mm -hmm. I, this discussion, and I forgot who I was speaking with, um, but I was talking about the uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, the original 80s film versus the remake of the very first film. And there's a, there's a scene when um, Nancy, who's the main character, is sleeping and Freddy Krueger is emerging from her bedroom's wall. And I remember reading that that was achieved by like the actor, I think, pressing against fabric um, and it's so it's a wonderful scene. And then I saw the CGI version, and in my opinion, it was terrible. It came across as being very cheap looking. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, what they were able to achieve in the '80s, it still seemed more real than when you look at the CGI version. And even the scene when she's walking up the steps and the steps are melting. Um, I forgot what she was actually walking in, but I saw the same scene in the remake. It was all CGI and it did not have the same effect, the same magic for me. Mm -hmm. um, well, so I sometimes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, so I can really appreciate how much effort, how much these people, these special effect people had to really work to achieve what they were able to achieve. And sometimes I think it holds up a lot better than when you look at CGI. Yeah, definitely. I agree. There's um, uh, Falcor, you know, Falcor writing was definitely a bad green screen situation, but they did the best they could with what, yeah. they, with what they had. Um, I, I definitely, uh, going back to before my dogs exploded, um, the, he did not like the way Falcor looked. Falcor oh. was not supposed to look nearly as much like a dog. Um, he was supposed to look like a golden tree retriever and a dragon and I think something else. But I don't know what he was expecting, honestly. Like I I can I can totally see the dragon aspect. He has scales. Um and um the the oracles he he felt that the the amount of bazoom was not appropriate. So, which I, I, I get, I get. That was a lot of buzzoom for a kid's movie. No, I, I agree. I remember, um, and I, I mentioned it to uh, my sister Alexandra that like that you wanted to mention that and watching that scene with the oracles, I remember, and I remember, I'm sure when I first watched that, I probably had a similar reaction. Like that's a bit too much cleavage mm -hmm. for a child's film. But whatever, I mean, going back to Falcor, that's probably one of the reasons why I love the character so much is mm -hmm. because he is this fantastic, this very powerful dragon, but he's not like when you see him, he's not gonna instill fear in you, which I think is important because Atreyu is a child. Yeah, So and everything else is terrifying. Yeah, and I often wonder if probably 
the director, that the writer was very nitpicky because he wasn't happy with who the director was. Right, he didn't um, want so him. I, I kind of feel like even if the director had achieved uh, the goal of making the writer as happy as possible, that the writer still would have been displeased. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I see that. He yeah. was, um, this was the most expensive German film up to that time in history. Mm -hmm. It was incredibly expensive to produce and um, everything it was supposed to take. I don't remember how long, but it wound up taking a year to film the whole thing. It was filmed in multiple locations. And so I, I, I do understand. And I also found like that um, Atreyu, Noah something, I don't remember his last name, um, was was almost seriously injured a few times like mm -hmm. um the horse poor artax when artax is drowning in the swamp of sadness i think it's called um mm -hmm. he he his leg got caught under the platform that he was that that artax was riding on and he, by the time they got him free, he was unconscious. And Gamork, the, the nothing beast, creature, wolf thing, mm -hmm. um, was somehow malfunctioned in, in the take where they were fighting. And they only got one take. And the, the artist, the producer would take regularly, would make people do 40 takes. So they only got that one take because like it was that one of the claws came down really close to his eye. Oh. Um, and actually, and I was looking after I read that and there's, you can see under his hair, there's an injury, which looks, you know, on like it, and it was come by honestly, but it was probably real. Hmm. Yeah, nothing would surprise me because especially there was a point in time, even in this country, where it's like the ethics of the way directors treated actors was really mm -hmm. appalling. You know, I can think about other films where the actors talked about their experience on set, like um, the actress who was in The Shining, the scene where Jack is breaking through the, the door. The actress was actually at a breaking point because she had been worked so hard by the director that I think she was having a mental breakdown in that scene. So I think she said, if it looks like I'm convincing is because she actually was losing it yeah. at that moment because she was driven to the point of mental exhaustion by the director. So that was Well, she does a good me. scene. That was a great scene. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Like the, Kubrick the, is a pro. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I you know, I, it, what was I saying? Um, I don't remember. Never mind. It was clearly super important. Um, oh yeah. Um, the, the kid who, who played Atreyu said, mm -hmm. you know, he, that producer was known for having the actors do their own stunts because he felt that it, it just ruined the authenticity if, like and and people knew when you switched out for a stunt person so they you know so he did his own he did all his own stunts um and some of them were clearly very dangerous uh so so was that really the actor in the scene where the nothing is destroying and he's blowing and he's hanging on to a tree yeah because i thought you could see a stunt double and i remember talking to my sister like do you think the director made him do that scene or was a stunt double so that was the actual actor in that scene? i think so it, I, it sounds like he didn't he didn't want stunt people involved because huh. you could see you could see when it changed when you when they changed the camera angle and um. it would be obvious when when the the double was put in so oh, see. yeah so that poor dude went through a lot mm -hmm. it's so interesting because watching that scene last night i could have sworn that was a stunt double in fact i was actually joking about how obvious it was that it was the stunt double 
but maybe it really wasn't. Oh, that's interesting that he, he wanted them to do their own. Because I can understand because there are moments when you can so tell that it's not the actor or the actress in that scene because the transit, it's so poor, you know, where you can really tell, okay, that's the stunt double. Um, oh, that's really interesting. I did not know that. So I mean, he could have used stunt doubles, but I do know that for the Gmork scene, he was, he, he got very hurt. And then um, he also was, was half drowned a little bit in the Artax scene. I also found out that um, they, they weren't even, they didn't even use a stunt horse for most of that. They had to spend so much time training the horse that played Artax to stand still on this ramp that was on this uh, platform that was descending and horses don't dig that kind of thing. So um, it took way longer than they thought to film because surprisingly animals don't like to be submerged in water. It's crazy. Oh, you know, it's so funny. I watched that scene and my sister was like, the horse looks terrified. And there's a moment where like the eyes look like they're bulging. And I'm like, I wonder, like I said, was the horse, I mean, I assume that they had used like a trained animal because the horse genuinely looks terrified in that scene. Mm -hmm. uh, now I feel really bad because if the poor, poor horse wasn't like used to it as, oh, yeah. That's... Well, they didn't nail him down or anything. He was, he was yeah. staying in place. He probably didn't like it because mm. nobody likes that and it's hard to stay still. And there was probably someone off camera like holding like a bunch of carrots. <laughs> this is all for you, baby. Um, but horses, uh, you know, now my daughter takes takes riding lessons. Um, and, and my husband and I have both observed that horses look crazy. They look like most of them do not necessarily have like the most docile faces. Some of them look like quite at peace, but after they've been riding for a while, sometimes they look a little, a little nutty. <laughs> I, I, I can see that after a while, they're just like, I'm not taking this anymore. But um, I actually have a picture of the cover for the book. I, I don't know if it's the original cover, but looking at Falcor, the way he's illustrated, he definitely looks a lot more um, almost lion-like. Can you hold it up? It kind of looks very terrifying. Yeah, that's not going to work. Um, okay, no. No, you cannot. Oh, 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 okay. Yeah, he totally looks like a lion. A lion with elf ears and yeah. Dracula fangs. Okay. <laughs> so it's like... So it's, it's definitely I, a lot more yeah. terrifying. <laughs> I like Falcor better. I like, you know, and it's, it's funny. That's the, what, what makes that movie is totally Fal is totally Falcor. You know, for me seeing mm -hmm. him riding this, this giant furry puppy boy, mm -hmm. uh, man, I, that was, that was awesome. I love dog faces are so kind so I can totally yeah. see why they chose that. Yeah, and it was so funny. I remember um, the, the, the actress who played the childlike empress and the young actor who played Bastion, they actually were on a German show to promote the film and they rode in on like a snail, like a giant snail. <laughs> and I remember that the, the German host, uh, when he greeted them, I. I don't know if he may have kissed their cheeks, but I remember I think he was, I don't know if he was ruffling the young boy's hair, like he was doing something. And you could see that the young boy was not pleased about being <laughs> touched. Like he had this angry look on his face. The actress was a bit more like, I don't know if she was, cause I know she's, a, she is American, the, the, the actress played. I don't know, maybe well, she was- Well, Bastion too, right? I think, yeah, I yeah, because I was thinking because the, the young girl seemed more comfortable being on like with the physical contact. So I don't know, maybe if she was sort of used to certain things. I don't know if she had been in France. Ahem, girl, Ahem. much less bodily autonomy. <laughs> I, I, I was trying to probably look for um, 
a, a less sort of bothersome angle to it, but that could also be it. But well, um, yeah, but she- because of abuse, but just because yes. like it's it's more it's more expected that a girl would be comfortable with that, you know, that I, I just remember that finding it. I just remember finding it really funny because the boy just looks like, like, what are you doing? Like he has that like mm-hmm. look on his face for the entire interview. It's, it's hysterical. Um, <laughs> but, but the girl is like laughing. She's talking with the host and everything. Mm-hmm. But I also think it's because it's a very European thing. Like I remember, um, Oh, what's the singer? I can't remember the singer's name, um, but she went on an Italian talk show. And at one point the host like caresses her head and gives her a kiss on her head. And I remember looking at my mom, I'm like, okay, I understand he's European. I said, but don't they have sort of an idea of boundaries? Um, and I just remember watching the, the singer's reaction, like almost like, what are you doing? Like, are you serious? <laughs> and, and, and that kind of reminded me, because I know with like Europeans, there's, there's more of that, um, there's less of that notion of personal space, so to speak. So anyway, so just watching that whole interview when the two uh, kids were promoting it in Germany kind of reminded me of that moment with the singer on the Italian talk show. So it was just, mm-hmm. but they rode in on a giant snail. I remember that and they were promoting the racing the, uh, snail. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, I, I thought that was kind of a funny moment because the way the, the young boy was like looking at the host, like, what are you doing? Um, but yeah, I also remember reading, which I completely forgot that the childlike empress is not as innocent as she appears. Like, I remember reading that this reviewer saying that she intentionally tricks children from our world into coming into Fantasia. Um, And basically, the more you wish, the more of your self-identity is eroded to the point that you eventually forget who you are. Hmm, And that and that in the book, you actually see other children that came from our world that are basically almost like mindless zombies. Right. I remember, Um, but I didn't think that was that they were brought by the childlike empress. I hmm, feel like that it was something else that that had brought them there and to that fate. I have to read. I'm I'm almost tempted to reread the story, but that's what some of the reviewers said. Maybe maybe they misread it, but now I kind of want to reread it. Yeah. um, Because I don't remember that either, um, that the childlike empress is that sort of malicious. well, I mean, she was definitely devious. She manipulated the whole, she manipulated Atreyu into yeah. this whole, you know, this this whole journey so that he could bait a boy <laughs> into into renaming her. So, um, you know, there's there's definitely some truth to the matter, and you know that she is childlike. She is thousands of years old. Yeah. So, and and actually, it was funny because like I always thought her voice, something about her voice always kind of bothered me. Mm. And, then, and then I found out she was wearing false teeth because her front yeah. two teeth were missing. So she had like a lisp that she worked very hard to get rid of. But um, so yeah, so it was it was interesting hearing that because because I was every time I saw her and I've watched this movie like as an adult too. And I'm like, God, her voice, there's something that's just so irritating about it. And it must Mm. be just the way she had to talk with those teeth. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I can see what I mean. I always thought her voice, like it's almost like the voice is the indication of how old she truly is versus Mm -hmm. her like physical appearance. Um, and I know, like, I was telling Lewis that they made, like, two other films in this um, series. Obviously, the actress and the actors had to be changed. Um, but um, I remember, I didn't realize they had made three. I thought there were only yeah. two. And I, and I remember seeing the, the second one. I don't remember the third. Um, I don't either. Yeah, like, I, I didn't even bother looking up information on it. But uh, I'm sure it's not as good as the, as the first one. But um, yeah, I I always liked the way the childlike empress spoke. I didn't realize, like, I'm sure I might have been aware of like a lispy thing, but I didn't know mm-hmm. why she sounded that way. I, right. 
I remember reading that she lost her teeth, uh, her front teeth, not all her teeth. Yeah. That would have just been. <laughs> that would be fairly traumatic for anybody. Yeah. And another funny thing that I read, because I remember in the book, Atreyu is green and has purple hair. Um, oh, yeah. 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 And I remember that I think they wanted to paint the actor green, but it just, it didn't look right. Right. It, like, I think the actor said it looked too cartoony. Well, somebody said it looked like moss. Yeah. So they basically decided not to do it. I feel, I feel like that was, that was a good choice. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that it would have been too, too jarring in a way. Like you couldn't, you couldn't identify with the character as much if he looked so different, you know, cause he at, you know, he was a boy and, mm -hmm. you know, like making him seem less less human um you know with with like completely unnatural coloring um like not necessarily if he was like another color than white but but yeah. green with purple hair um like that's you're, you're never gonna see that um i i think that would have made us forget that he was just like 15 that he was on this like mission and he handled himself like a, like a man, like, but you wouldn't necessarily see that that's, that wouldn't be really the case for most people if he didn't look identifiably like a child. True, yeah, yeah. I, I, I remember when I watched the film and this was after I read the book, I was like, oh, he's supposed to be green with purple hair. But I think even if they would have been able to achieve it, I could kind of see how a green kid with purple hair walking around like, eh, how that probably would not have been the best choice. I mean, and I think that just goes to show you that what can be acceptable in a book may not translate well onto like the big screen. So I, I can kind of understand why they decided not to go with that choice. It would look, it would look um, Oompa Loompa-ish. Yes. I think. Yeah, yeah definitely. And it was so funny. I, I, I remember when I watched the film, I could never understand the name that Bastian gives her. And I remember mm -hmm. reading that in the book, he calls her Moonchild. Right. I thought that his mom's name was Moonchild. I was like, Thank oh. you. Thank you. But then when I watched the film last night, I could clearly hear Moonchild. I'm like, Me too. Oh. So he definitely calls her Moonchild. And Alexander looked at him and she was like, what, you didn't know that? I was like, I could never tell what he shouted. Because Moonchild is a dumb name. But I was, I was trying to, I was trying to think though, even in my, and Alexander was like, were, were, were his like mom's like parents hippies? And I'm like, I mean, definitely not the dad. I mean, and I got to talk about the dad in a minute. Yes, like, I know. Coffee quickly. Oh, that's a good idea. I'm getting mine. <laughs> I, I think, I think we should, should say that we generally always have some sort of coffee with us when we do this. Yes. Um, what I will admit to my um, listeners is that um, I am very much a coffee holic, which mm -hmm. is a figure of all the vices. Liking coffee too much is, you know, the least harmful of, of the bunch. But um, yes, so I have my iced coffee with me. But my coffee was hot, but now it is iced. It is <laughs> <laughs> but it's yeah, great. it just goes through a transition. It's magnificent. It is magnificent. Ice or, or, or cold, whatever you like. Um, but yeah, I remember thinking Moonchild. I was like, that is just such a bizarre name. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't understand if it had been something that a child just randomly picks, but he says, I should give her my mom's name. She had a beautiful name. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. okay, even if your parents were. <laughs> like maybe Rose or Lily or Marigold or Stella like I can but like Moonchild like his mom would have been called Moonchild it, I'm so, it seems so bizarre but um, I'm gonna redo this that's yes. what I'm gonna do I'm gonna say I'm gonna put my story out there it was just badly written because it was and then there was no author consultation in the script because he kind of pieced out on the whole production mm -hmm. um maybe that was her nickname for him huh 
if her nickname for him was Moonchild. And and I think it works better with his whole like having to get his head out of the clouds and blah blah blah. Naming her Moonchild frees him from being a child. Like now he can continue to grow and the dad is just a jerk. <laughs> I know it never it and we'll transition to talking about the dad. Because the, the film opens up where Bastian has had a disturbing dream about his mother. And what you learn fairly on is that the mother has passed away. You don't know why she's passed, but she is dead. So Bastian is having breakfast. Um, his father is, you know, making um, his morning shake. With and, egg and orange juice. That yes. needs to be stated. That is a disgusting, disgusting thing to do. <laughs> but, uh, you know, yeah. So, I mean, maybe it tastes good. I don't know. But, um, and Bastian <laughs> told his, you know, father, I've had it. I had another dream about mom. And you can see that the father pauses before cracking his egg and he looks at his son, but the words that come out of his mouth don't match, I'm sure, what he's actually feeling. Because when you, when the father talks it, and I remember this, this, this moment always bothered me. It bothered me uh, two nights ago when I first started watching the film. It bothered my sister. It's, it still bothers me because the way the father behaved, and I understand for some people, that's how you process your grief. Everyone processes grief differently. I understand that I'm not right. trying to say that there's a right way to respond to grief. But at that moment, you are his father. Yeah, that's, that's what kills me. I mean, to say, you know, I understand, son, but we can't allow mom's death to get in the way of, what does he say? The... Yeah, I don't remember. Business or to get in the way of business. Right, right. Something. Even, even if you're not going to hug your son and kiss him, at least say, I understand, son. You know, I too have had dreams, but you know, life has to continue. Like mm -hmm. even if you said that, it would have been better for me. But the way he talks to his son, it's almost like he's having a business transaction. Yes. At the end where he says, I'm glad we had this talk, son. We should do this more often. And I'm like, yeah. really? So I, I don't know. So, I mean, I have no doubt that the father cares for the son. I'm not questioning the care, but it's like, your son is, I'm assuming Bastian is supposed to be what, eight, nine years old, maybe 10? Something it's like, like that, yeah. That's how you talk to him after he's clearly distressed and has told you, I had a dream about my dead mother. I, the yeah. thing is, you know, I, I understand like the dad went through a trauma too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that it's probably more that he's like, I cannot deal with your grief on top of my grief. So yes. I'm going to tell you to man up. And, you know, and like, that's, that's like the perfect way to make you know, like toxic masculinity and all of those wonderful things that would come from like a, a parent, especially a masculine parent saying, you know, got to move on, dude, got to move on. Um, but, you know, like that's really, you know, like you look for those moments as a parent and I can't imagine being a grieving parent, but I can imagine I mean, actually, you know, you, we we did lose a pet and it it wasn't obviously losing a spouse, but it was traumatic for everyone. But you if if you've got your if you've got your goals in order, you will invite your child to talk about it, even if it makes you cry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's you know, men mentioning, you know, losing a pet and I won't, you know, spend too long on this, but um, I, my family and I recently lost our dog and each of us is definitely processing the grief differently. And for me, it's been more of like, I need to be strong. Like I haven't yet cried in front of any of my family uh, because I feel like I can't, I like, I can't do that because if I'm crying and they're crying, like it almost makes it worse. 
So I, I can sort of understand how your default response, where obviously the in this case, the, the father has lost his wife. Mm -hmm. So he is definitely grieving. Now he has to handle the responsibility of taking care of their son on his own. So I understand that. But it's just like, I, I still think you can handle your grief in your own way. But when it comes to especially a child who comes to you, I just wish the response could have been different. Um, yeah, but I mean, I do think it's a, oh, I'm sorry. No, no. And that's basically all I'll say. I mean, I, I a part of me still kind of wishes the response was different. Mm -hmm. I do think it's a reflection of 80s parenting expectations, mm. you know, and, and we, we've discussed that, you know, in, in the, you know, in the Stranger Things episode about the 80s where, you know, if there was anybody that was going to be connected with the kid, it was the mom. Mm -hmm. And the dad was not expected to have really an emotional connection with the kid as much as the mom. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it may, may have been that the dad was at work and mom was taking care of him. And, mm -hmm. you know, if he had a skin knee, he would never go to dad. And now both of them are forced into this, this um, abrupt shift in the way they try to relate to each other because he's a kid. He needs to, mm -hmm. he needs to have someone to guide him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you make a good point. And I'm also sure that's what it is too. Um, the expectation, especially at a particular time that it would have been the mom dealing with specific issues. The father would be dealing with those issues. Um, yeah, so it is it is sad all around that, you know, they're both dealing with loss, but they're both dealing with that loss in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so while I understand, I still kind of wish it was different. But of course, um, but and I, I understand, of course. Um, I didn't notice in like my first and then in my second watching of it, which was like what when we started do when we started having to quarantine, I like fell back on every single old movie that made me happy mm -hmm. <laughs> so I watched it a couple of months ago and um I, I was like god ask the table what is going on here mm -hmm. and I didn't realize until I watched it again yesterday that he was making his own lunch like oh. that the like he's trying to open the peanut butter because he's making his own lunch Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's another aspect of care that's been, you know, just like, oh, you're now a grown up. Grown ups make their own lunch. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I did not even, I assumed he was making his breakfast. Oh, yeah, okay. Because he's got the Ziploc bag, he's oh. got the Wonder Bread. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. Oh, yeah, it's so funny. When I watched that scene, another thing was that he's struggling to open the jar, and then the, the father, like, sees him quickly, like, opens the jar, and then, like, puts it back down, and I don't, and I can't remember what my sister Alexandra, because she was watching it with me, like, what she said, almost like, I don't want to misquote her, but something about, like, real men should be able to open that jar, like, obviously, she was, like, joking, but that's what right, right. was across, like, well, you know, you should have been able to open this, <laughs> you know, you, you know, um, but we were even thinking like, and obviously I'm assuming the father, when he realizes his son isn't home, like my sister was like, do you think the dad like was searching for him? And, and I remember thinking the same thing because obviously you don't know because the, the film right. ends, you know, where he shouts out the name and then, you know, he's creating all of Fantasia again. But like one would assume the father, if he saw that his son wasn't coming home, like he would say, well, what's going on here? Um, yeah, but I, I never I never thought to realize that he's also making his own lunch. It's so funny because I remember my mom would make our lunches for us. And it's something that I remember um, that there were times when we, when we were in high school, um, we would forget to bring our lunch so my mom would, you know, tell our family group and come to our family group or our guidance office. They called them family groups when I was in high school. 
and she would bring our lunch there and we would go there. And my mom would buy us this pack of four cookies and they were these soft cookies. And I remember when I would open my lunch bag, like it would put a smile on my face because my mom mm-hmm. bought us those cookies. Um, and recently I was thinking about it and it just like made me so happy because it was like that little extra something that, that my mom didn't have to do, but you know, she was bringing our lunch to us and she bought us cookies. Mm-hmm. And yeah. my mom would always make our lunches up until a certain point, obviously when, you know, by the time we were in high school, it goes without saying we were making our own lunches. Um, but uh, but I remember just that little extra thing that she would put in there. Um, and it would always make me happy because being in high school, the happiest point of the day was when I was leaving, you know, <laughs> <laughs> not going to lie. So when I would see that in my lunch bag, it would make me happier. Like right. I'm here, but at least I have this nice lunch and my mom bought me cookies. Right. It's a memory of, of the way you feel when you're, when you're home and safe mm-hmm. and, you know, and it's the, like, I, I started when Ellie started kindergarten, I would put notes in with her food and, um, and then I stopped because I was crazy busy mm-hmm. and, and then she was, then she told me like, why don't you put, like, she was crying about something and then all of a sudden, it, like, you know, just, just apropos of nothing, you don't put lunch m- notes in my bag. And, you know, and I, I my grandmother would do that when she packed our lunch, but she wouldn't do it every day. So I kind of didn't think it was mandatory every day until that point that my daughter, you know, said, and, you know, and she struggles. School is not like her favorite, her favorite thing either. Mm -hmm. So for her, for her that, you know, opening the bag and seeing like a note that just reminds her is like just just that extra push to get to the end of the day. Yeah, my my mom when she was watching my niece more, um, she would um, peel the apples for my niece, and to make it easier for my niece, she just started sticking the apple on a fork. <laughs> my niece, the fork and the apple would be stuck on the fork, and she did it once. I don't think my mom thought that she would repeat it. It was basically just to make it easier for my niece to hold the fork. And she can chew on her apple. But I think it became a thing. My niece really liked it that my mom would do it all the time. So whenever she would peel the apple for my niece, she'd stick it on a fork and give it to my niece that way. So it's almost like these little things that you start to do um, that eventually become so significant and basically help you through your day or just become special moments you know, I don't know if my niece will ever remember this, you know, obviously, you know, she's, she's older now. I mean, there are some things she does remember about, you know, what my mother would do for her or what I would do for her. But I have a lot of memories around my mom and school or my dad and school and things that we used to do that became rituals, which I definitely miss. Right. Or like the rituals have evolved into something else, but I can see the importance of even something as small as, you know, my mom or my dad made my lunch. Right. But yeah, so going back to bringing it back to that scene, um, I, it didn't register with me that he's also making his lunch. Yeah. Um, and I don't think, as, you know, I, I, I don't think the significance would have been there for me. You, you know, like, like it made me really sad. Mm. You know, that this little boy you know, has been, has just been forced into this, like, you know, you're the semi man of the house now, and, you know, and I'm not going to make your lunch, you can make your lunch. And it's not, you know, is there magic in, in these things is like, I, I've said to, like, I, I make masks. Um, I, I make, like I sew masks whenever, whenever I can, because, you know, we run out of masks at an an alarming rate, Mm -hmm. Um, even though it's just usually my husband using them. But, and he said, like, why don't you just buy masks? And I said, because that's the only thing I can do to protect you. 
Mm. So, you know, like all of this stuff that you do for children is protective magic. No, definitely. Um, definitely. I can, I can understand, I can understand that. I was even thinking going back to the father when he's making his breakfast, like I'm wondering if that egg and juice became his breakfast because up until that point, he probably wasn't making it. Like right. his wife was also making them all breakfast. That's a good point. Yeah, and then maybe the fact that, well, I don't have the person that I love to make me this anymore, so I'm just doing whatever, like the bare minimum, even for myself. Right. She made me eggs and orange juice. Yeah. So I make myself eggs and orange juice, but I don't care enough to do it right. And I remember my mother told me that when she was younger, um, her father would make them breakfast. So they would have like milk sweetened with something. And my grandfather would make fresh bread and he would make each thing specific to his daughter. So he knew like, for example, my mom did not like the, um, the soft part of the bread. She just wanted the crust. So he would just cut the crust for her and that's what he would put in the milk. One of my aunts would eat everything. She wasn't picky. So he knew what each of his daughters wanted and he would make the breakfast specific to each of them. And then he would call them when it was ready and they would all sit down and they would eat it. So, you know, and my mother still remembers that. And it's a very special memory for her that her father would make him breakfast and he knew what each of his daughters wanted and he made it specific to them. Well, that's, that's actually so funny because that must be, that must be an immigrant thing because my grandmother who came from, from um, Germany would make me the same thing and Mm -hmm. she would she would toast me bread and like I discussed this with Dan and he was like disgusted at the thought like she (laughs) she would toast me bread and put it in warm milk with sugar and cinnamon Mm -hmm. and it was the best thing ever and and even even still when I'm having a rough day, sometimes I just dip right white bread in milk and eat it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's amazing. I think also that it shows that even the simple things or simple gestures have greater significance than the most grandiose gestures. Mm-hmm. I think those simple gestures are done with love and there's more of a genuine genuineness if that he is a word <laughs> <laughs> to, to what is what what is being done. So yeah, so that and I think it also is a testament to how well that scene is shot, how well it's acted, that from that brief interaction, it tells you so much about what is going on in that household. Um, during this time and you don't know how long it's been since the mother has passed there's no indication of this is it something recent has it been a few months has it been a year or two years Mm -hmm. you don't know um but but yeah it's but it, it, it just like so much is said um by just watching that interaction right um also um i did want to mention that i read that there, like, and I, I sort of see this, but I did not have a chance to go through frame by frame when um, they're all standing outside of the, the palace. But I saw that um, there are, there's an, there's an Ewok and E.T. is there. And like, this is what I read. I, I think I saw Chewbacca and what looked like an Ewok in one of the long shots. Um, but I'd be curious to run through frame by frame, but that is that is something that I read that, you know, since it's all of all of people's imaginations, and especially now that it's it's Bastion's mm-hmm. imagination that it fed off of. But um you know, I, I still didn't get a chance to, to run through it and find screenshots or anything. Oh, that's interesting. Now it kind of makes me want to rewatch it, see if I can catch that. Um, so 
Is there anything, Amy, that you wanted to like conclude the, the podcast with mentioning or? Um, oh, yes. Yes, I did want to talk about one more thing. Um, Ergol and Engewuk. Eng, Eng, oh, yeah. Engewuk <laughs> or something. Engewuk, I think. Um, mm -hmm. The little, the little um, gnome couple that Atreyu meets at the Southern Oracle. Mm -hmm. um, I saw that again, like when I saw it the like first time as an adult recently, at, you know, sometime over the summer, I think. And this time when I was watching it again, all I could think of was the couple that were arguing in The Princess Bride like the the wizard and his wife oh i haven't I'm not a witch i'm your wife oh I, I don't yeah it's been a while since i watched that film so i don't recall it's the exact same relationship oh <laughs> it's really funny um because i i saw it like right away i was like wow this is like the princess bride and then i like i try to just put in like a random Google search to see if anybody else noticed it. And like one, I found one blog that said something like that it made, made him or her wonder uh, which came first, like the princess bride arguing couple or Inga Wook and, and Urgel. Uh, yeah. They have a very interesting dynamic. I like how we called, I like the line where he says, to the winch, wench. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if when the actor first said that line, because think about it, to the winch, wench. Yes. You have to say that line, like how many times he must have messed it up. But, it's just, but I like how she handles everything in stride. You know, she's not the star, yeah. whatever, by her science. And I, oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, no. And I just realized I called her, I called him her uncle. I met her husband husband okay <laughs> um i just want to thank you again for listening to us um we hope that you enjoyed this podcast and um we'll see you soon um and we're going to continue with our november nostalgia and thank you again everyone for listening to us thank you take care everyone have yeah great day everyone stay safe and be well